to another episode of the Wimper podcast. We have Shonak sir here from Physics for Students. He has a YouTube channel with over 10,000 subscribers where he teaches very very interesting topics on the quantum and classical mechanics to students and they watch in hundreds and thousands uh, of views. So, yeah. Uh, Mr. Shonak, welcome to the Wimper podcast. Uh, how do you uh, like how would you like to introduce yourself? First of all, a very good evening to everybody around the world who is watching this podcast. And first of all, I would like to thank Divyansh uh, for inviting me to this podcast. And my pleasure, my pleasure. Uh, I would like to wish the Wimper podcast to grow up and up and up, uh, up till infinity. So uh, this is a really good time uh, because looking at Divyansh, a very young person look, uh, doing a great amount of job. I went through Vimpers for a few of the podcasts. The people that you are really connecting, it is all about connectivity and the type of work that you are doing. I am really thankful. I am grateful that entire society should be thankful to Divyansh and his efforts because you are really trying to bring science mathematics and everything right up to uh, in front of the people so that they can enjoy, learn and enrich themselves. So a big thanks to Vimper and wishing you all the best Divyansh for your uh, journey. Well, uh, Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. welcome. So uh, to, to tell a little bit about me, nothing much. Uh, I am a physics enthusiast. It has been a dream from my childhood that I would be teaching uh, physics uh, special into uh, Einstein's theory of relativity, which is one of my, uh, you know, special subjects. So uh, as per my work, it is concerned, I work with a very big international uh, brand where I mentor students in order to pave their path, in order to get jobs internationally, mentor them with uh, the do's and don'ts of interviews, etc. Apart from that, I uh, make uh, YouTube videos uh, especially in order to uh, make complex things sound simple. And the basic idea is that there are a lot of misconceptions about physics, mathematics, and it has been uh, created a romantic and a rosy picture. And I see that young students are getting diverted. So the basic idea of my channel is to give the right path, the right direction. I started this channel just with a piece of pen and a paper when I used to draw those calculus integrations on uh, on white uh, paper with a sketch pen and slowly drew up so i really am thank to my subscribers the way it has grew uh, it has it has started to grow up because i never thought that i would and now i really perceive myself to go more and more into youtube and social media uh, i own a page called hawking in facebook uh, which is dedicated to uh, Stephen William Hawking, who has been my mentor since my childhood in class 10, when I first read A Brief History of Time and was fascinated by his uh, mentality and how could he do those calculations all into his head. Apart from this, I play piano and I am an official translator of Arabic and Urdu language. And I have translated few of the engineering documents from the Ministry of Water Resources, Iraq. And my continuous journey is to learn, learn and learn until we understand the truth. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you can see how vast the areas of interest that he has. It is going to be a very productive episode. So you, you don't click this off. and You're not going to miss this out. But anyways, uh, a disclaimer, we are not going to be diving very deep into the mathematical concepts of it after I've understood the very basics and top layer uh, of uh, Einstein's field equations. Why? Because a lot of people are maybe not just going to understand a lot of parts of it. So we'll try to be as specific as possible towards the theories and the philosophies uh, that are related towards Einstein's field equations. And I hope you enjoy this episode. Moving on with the first question that I have on my script. Okay, so after learning the basics of Einstein's field equations, um, so I've understood that I have to, you know, sort of ask you to introduce the audience to what they are, e even though they can sure. find the answers to this question on Google, like what are, what are Einstein's field equations? Just uh, an introduction to them. Uh, so I would love okay. to hear what, yeah, what you think and what, uh, how can you explain it to us? 
Okay. So this is uh, uh, something very uh, interesting, and I really want to thank you for this uh, very generic question, which leaves a lot of scope to talk upon. Now, see, the thing is that, first of all, we call it Einstein's field equations. It is a plural, but we see only one set of equations. So the thing is that what happens, these are a set of 16 partial nonlinear differential equations, which has been framed in one single equation. So originally, when you see those R mu nu minus half G mu nu, followed by a cosmological constant in this monstrous equation. So actually, you're looking at 16 partial nonlinear differential equations. I understand I won't go too much into the technical details, but I have explained these in many parts on my episode on the videos is that six of those equations are similar. I'm to say, for example, what about 1, 2 and 2, 1? They are similar. What about 1, 3 and 3, 1? They are similar. So what happens is that in this way, if you're aware about the indices and those tensor, okay, let, let me make it more simple. Certain part of the equations are duplicate. So we uh, remove those duplicate parts and what we get are a set of 10 differential nonlinear equations, which the Einstein's field equations speak of. So what happens is that when we go deep into Einstein's field equations, we will see that there are six components of this equation, specifically the tensor indices, which are quite common. So in order to remove those six equations, 16 minus 6 becomes 10. So it is a set of 10 partial nonlinear differential equation. This is all in all why we say equations, although we look at equation that clears the doubt. So we are looking at 10 partial nonlinear differential equation. Now, remember the Vyansh and as well, as well as to all the viewers, it took Einstein 10 years to develop those equation, which we are trying to talk in on one hour time. Mm. <laughs> you understand that. Mm. So it is mm. highly complex and not only Einstein, it involves almost one of the world's topmost brains in order to develop those equation. So what is Einstein field equation? Uh, I, I won't go what internet says, what you can really find out as you really pointed out the right thing that we should not uh, do. In, but uh, in general, Einstein field equation is the pivotal force which rules the entire science of general theory of relativity. That means that we today know that gravity is not a fictitious force which was perceived by Isaac Newton or Galileo or Copernicus that when a body is falling, there is some kind of force which is pulling it down. We know it as a curvature of space time. Now, uh, it is very easy to say that is a curvature of space time. But when we sa sit down to, uh, you know, uh, do those equations, we really lose our night sleep for night after night after night. So what really happens is that the Einstein field equation shows that the curvature of space time actually is responsible for what is called the gravity. So uh, just to give you give a summarize what I'm telling it is that this is a set of equations. Remember, it was not only Einstein, we might come up in the later part of our podcast. There are several people who were involved in developing these equations. Uh, I don't know whether the viewers are aware. The fact is that Einstein was not aware about tensor calculus. He was not right. aware about mm -hmm. differential geometry, right? Mm -hmm. It was, was Marcel skeptical, Brock. He was skeptical yes. about, about the expansion of the universe right. and Absolutely. whether it being Absolutely. static. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So mm -hmm. this equation actually uh, has entirely changed our perception of looking into space and time, which is no longer space as different, time as different, but all lumped together in what is called space-time. So uh, to summarize, it is a set of 10 nonlinear partial differential equations, which has changed our perception of looking into space and time. The left-hand side side of the equation actually tells that how we can measure the curvature of space-time. And the right-hand side equation, the momentum stress energy tensor, tells that how matter is responsible for curvature of space-time. So obviously, the curvature and the matter, when they are equated towards each other, what comes is that as matter moves, there is a curvature in space-time, and this curvature is what we call gravity. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And if you could just uh, explain us, how does general relativity and, and uh, 
and uh, quantum mechanics idea of gravity differentiate from the one that a uh, newton and other people who okay. worked on classical mechanics explained it yeah. okay okay this is a wonderful question thank you for this question so see what happened is that now this is again a almost i would say 50 years of history which i have to somehow summarize in a few minutes time anyway so just to tell that uh, see what happens that during during the time when isaac newton invented uh, I, i won't say invented but the concept of gravity was much earlier to uh, newton newton actually formulated those in a set of equations which was uh, philosophy naturalis principia mathematica which personally i uh, i should I, i should consider this is something which i keep it uh, on on my bed i put it close to my heart because it is the one single book which changed our entire perception of mechanics right so uh, it is a kind of a book which i i personally feel that we should have uh, on our uh, on 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 our, on our library personally so when philosophy naturally principia mathematica i was entirely revolutionized we came to know that gravity we formulated f equals to g m1 m2 upon r square inverse square square law all these things started up so what happened is that you remember uh, divyansh uh, i i don't know this is something interesting i would like to point out that isaac newton was very skeptical in publishing his thoughts yes why yeah Mm-hmm. No, because during yeah. that time uh, if you remember galileo was yeah. uh, actually taken as a prisoner within his house right and mm-hmm. uh, the church was allowed uh, told him that you should not further write because it is considered to be blasphemy this yes. time yes. and when galileo the went threaten. to the, he was bound to say by the priest by the church mm-hmm. that you have to accept that the mm-hmm. sun moves and the earth is stationary he made a famous italian comment appears to be moving it means yeah, yeah. still it moves he looked up and he said appears to be moving that means it still moves so th- that was you know if you read einstein's book i was reading this a wonderful book called richard westfalls never at rest it's a big it's a fat book about 1000 pages which speaks more about mostly mostly of newtons newton was very skeptical because he believed in alchemy and he thought that okay if i bring out those uh, principles of science then i would also be punished so what happened one day uh, uh, this uh, 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 you know uh, haley uh, the whom we yeah. know as haley yeah, yeah. 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 so haley went there and he told that come on uh, guy what what the hell are you doing so he told that see these are my uh, physics laws etc he told that come on let us publish it you know no 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 i won't be able to publish it so the, he was keeping it very close to his heart so uh, mm-hmm. so uh, what happened arthur haley who uh, actually published it and slowly it came to the press and it eventually he took his own money to for the first time to publish it so the world came to know about the fictitious force which nobody can explain prior to newton is some kind of a force which is well defined in the laws of mechanics post newton what we see is that the entire physics and even today uh, all revolved around the formula of mechanics with the advent of albert einstein i mean to say uh, einstein you remember that was uh, a famous quotation which uh, i i it was something the vyansh you know extraordinary now you know he was sitting at the uh, patent office at bern around 1902 and he didn't got any job so albert einstein was uh, telling that uh, that cloistered place on earth which hatched those beautiful thoughts so if you see uh, in switzerland it is just a small table right just a small table a small mm-hmm. chair and einstein mm-hmm. was sitting there and throughout very, the day it's all very the, what you say is very similar to the idea in philosophy that is chaos brings order something like that absolutely um, you are very yeah. right actually chaos mm-hmm. brings order so he told that mm-hmm. that worldly cloister where i hatched my most beautiful ideas so 1902 around june he received the letter that okay i have got a kind of an appointment and 1906 he was promoted as a technical expert so what he was doing i was reading a wonderful blog 8 hours of uh, study uh, i mean to say 8 hours of work 8 hours of study uh, scientific study and 8 hours of sleep so this actually happened so you un- understand in that small cloister place where there is one small room and a, a, you know a small desk and a chair and all the people were coming he hatched the most beautiful thoughts what was that 
so einstein was thinking that if i'm sitting on a piece of on on a chair and suddenly the ground moves away suddenly now you might say the what kind of crazy idea it was but it requires craziness to be a genius right so suddenly the 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 the, the entire uh, the entire uh, uh, the, uh, the the floor would move away and he was falling so he and he perceived that if i am falling right at this moment so i would not feel any gravity right i would not feel the pressure that my stomach is going up or something odd is happening same thing will happen if a person is falling from space remember we are talking of that time when he has already framed his special theory of relativity and there was an attempt to do a relativistic uh, formulations of maxwell's equation with einstein so suddenly he thought that what would happen if i suddenly start falling so immediately the thought that came into einstein's mind is that so if if i could not feel anything if if i could not feel that i am falling down that means there should not be any force and if mm-hmm. there is no force then there is no point of uh, terming as a gravity and why mm-hmm. we should talk it as gravity mm-hmm. now you see um, that this is yeah yeah you continue yeah. Continue, continue, continue. Mm-hmm. now this is actually what you were telling right that uh, chaos being brings order and i you know i will come to that part but just a point that you know the bench today we talk that how when we are studying mathematics we should have a ac room nobody would be talking i should have a laptop i should have a pen and a paper and think about that person 1902 in a cloistered place where there was just table and chair he could hatch one of the greatest ideas which revolutionized science that means what the message to uh, to us is that you really don't need anything in order to do a scientific thought all you mm. need is a kind of a thinking so it was during that time that i will come to another very interesting story of karl schwarzschild i think the viewers mm-hmm. either, uh, it it would be a wonderful point to talk about so when he thought that there is nothing called gravity then why we should coin the term as gravity mm. number 1 second thing is that it was called gedanken g e d a n k e n in german mm. it means thought experiment okay so he was thinking that if i am going moving up the elevator if the elevator is going up and if i shine a a, a, a photon or a or a beam of light mm. then when the elevator suddenly goes up the la- beam of light instead of going straight obviously it would curve down it is going up 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 and as the elevator goes down the light bends the light bends now why it is bending because the corpuscular theory of newton's light says that light travels in straight line light travels mm-hmm. in absolute straight line then why when we are moving up the elevator remember that einstein perceived all in his thought so neither uh, there yeah, was this is a, this is an imaginative perception of it like is this actually happening in practicality like does the yes, light actually seem to bend absolutely yes so later when we uh, you will see if you watch my videos i have demonstrated that if the lift is going up in this direction the mm-hmm. light instead of going in a straight direction will start moving in this direction and i i will say i will tell you the best thing to perceive for general people because we cannot shine a light when you are going down a mall elevator the best mm-hmm. thing is that you know when you stand in front of the ocean either mm-hmm. you go to philippines or any 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 seashore you will see right at the horizon when you are standing straight the waves are coming you will see that the ocean and the sea somehow seems to meet at the horizon right okay. you will see that yeah, when you yeah. stand in front of the uh, seashore yeah. right mm-hmm. so that shows that the, the 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 ocean surface is something like this something like this so that was a fiery moment i would say one of the greatest moment that a person could live and he understood that that means what we can tell is that there is nothing which is called gravity now this is again vivian this is a very misconception most of my students have tell sir that means there is no gravity no this is this is, this is something wrong I it mean, is nothing it, that it these, is wrong i mean you're saying that basically the idea of gravity in classical mechanics is completely different and that's why we need to interpret it in absolutely. a different way 
Yeah. Absolutely. Gravity mm-hmm. in its classical phase is still there. Newton's laws of mechanics are still working. And even when we are spending, you know, um, you know, uh, sending space shuttle, etc. Up to a level, you will see the rocket goes up and then it bends down. All these are Newtonian mechanics. But mm-hmm. up to the way when Einstein thought that if there is nothing which is called a force, then mm-hmm. why we should call it as a gravity? Now, mm-hmm. that was basically the moment when mm. Einstein thought of, to, you know, uh, what I would say, generalizing special theory of relativity, which was quite good, but which was applicable on the non-accelerated frames of reference. That means in a non-accelerated frame of reference, special theory of relativity was working absolutely fine. Mm. But what if the frames of reference are accelerated? What if there is an arbitrary movement? So that is what this answers your question that that actually started Einstein to remove the equations of special theory of relativity from Mm. a non-inertial frame of uh, 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 frame of reference to an inertial frame or accelerated frames of reference Mm. when things are started to move. So that is basically the moment when Einstein thought of improving, I won't say it is wrong. Again, this is something I recently talked about in one of my videos that can we tell a scientific theory wrong? No, please. We cannot tell something as wrong. Mm. It is all fine uh, Mm. up to that frames of reference, right? Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. Einstein's improved and generalized the special theory of relativity's equation so that it becomes applicable to Mm. accelerated frames of reference. And that gave birth to Mm. Einstein's field equations. Mm. Right. And and you mentioned Schwarzschild's uh, equations and the theory behind the theory. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. That that yeah. So actually that that actually calls for a wonderful, you know, inspirational story. So if you just allow me, I will just like to speak for a few yeah, minutes. Sure, sure. So mm-hmm. what happened? It was during nineteen fifteen when mm-hmm. Albert Einstein has already published his general theory of relativity. Uh, Arthur Eddington on twenty ninth of May had tested that the sun rays uh, during the eclipse bends and everything was fine. But remember that we are unable to find out what is called an exact solution of Einstein's field equation. I'm coming to what do I mean by exact solution? I need to explain on that. Now, during this time, if you if you remember history, that first world war was already on. And Germany, in order to uh, acquire more and more, I would say, uh, soldiers, they were even taking people who are 40 years plus. And Mm -hmm. Karl Schwarzschild was around 40, 41 years during that time. Uh, In general, the rule is that you cannot accept somebody who has passed 30. You cannot join in in the army. But during that time, it was. So Karl Schwarzschild was actually appointed in order to calculate the movement of the ballistic cannons where it will fly and where it will land. Mm. And he was actually in a trench. In a mm. trench and health wise he was not so okay. So, was he this, was... so, so you're saying was this a time before uh, or after Newton? No, no, it is after obviously it is 1915 we are talking about. Oh, okay. uh, much yeah, 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 after yeah. that. Yeah, yeah got, absolutely. Got it, got it. Got it, got it, got it. Yeah. So yeah. he, because of his ill health, etc., the mm. commander of the army told, okay, okay, you are good in calculations uh, because he was a professor of astronomy during that time. So you do the calculations. So what mm. happened during that time, sitting inside a trench when there is a full-fledged war going on with just a piece of pen and a paper, uh, what today we require almost like a supercomputer or a mainframe computer with MATLAB and everything to solve mm-hmm. Einstein's equation, he started uh, writing down those equations and sent a letter to Albert Einstein. So mm-hmm. around 23rd or 25th of 24th of December, Einstein suddenly received the letter. And the letter mm-hmm. was blood stained, it was all full of mud, etc. And he opened that letter and he was surprised. What is that letter telling? That letter told that, yes, my dear Dr. Albert Einstein, I have found the first exact solution of your equation. Mm. Einstein was totally puzzled. Now, he Mm -hmm. himself was the inventor of general theory of relativity, yet Mm -hmm. he could not find out the uh, uh, solution of Einstein's field equation. Mm -hmm. A person Mm -hmm. lying in the trench when the war is going on, no electricity, nothing. He was working with candles. How he can find out my exact solutions? Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. So you know, I I don't remember that line. It was uh, Schwarzschild was telling that uh, your equations has given me the pleasure to walk down the beautiful meadows and paths of uh, tensors, equations, etc. And in this time when I am in the trench, when the war is going on, I am finding a lot of pleasure, a lot of happiness in solving these equations. Mm-hmm. Just let us think that. today we need computer today we need a ac room today we need uh, sound proof rooms in order to do mathematics but think of karl schwarzschild who did all those superhuman ability lying under the trench when the war was going on anyway mm. einstein uh, when he read that letter promised uh, karl schwarzschild writing back that i will be publishing that in the uh, upcoming prussian academy of sciences uh, about your letter and i am very happy to get that and eventually schwarzschild died around 40 to 43 years old and uh, einstein published that and i would like to bring attention to the viewers that that was the first equation that was the first general solution which gave birth to the concept of black holes mm. so what uh-huh. schwarzschild did is that schwarzschild actually found out an equation that given a certain gravitational intense gravitational force all the laws of physics are going to break down all the laws of physics are going to fail and the entire uh, the point where the entire universe will be condensed at an infinite small small point when the physics laws were will break and that is what is called now a schwarzschild radius that means beyond that radius if you move you will fall inside the black hole and there is no point of escaping mm mm-hmm. So Schwarzschild radius is um, like what the event horizon of a black hole? No, actually, I will tell you, Schwarzschild radius first of all is a kind of a conceptual framework. It actually doesn't exist in general. Schwarzschild mm-hmm. radius is something. Say, for example, if I take my telephone, if I take this mobile, right? If I squeeze this mobile, I'm squeezing and squeezing and squeezing and squeezing and further, and mm-hmm. I have to squeeze that. as low as i can up to a critical radius i repeat mm-hmm. it is a critical radius that means a radius beyond which i cannot further squeeze it down so i'm squeezing it to a small radius and if i squeeze this mobile to a certain radius this mobile will turn into a black hole okay so that means for example i am here 5 ft 6 inches high if mm-hmm. you can squeeze me up to a size of 1 femtometer 1 mm. femtometer which is extremely small if 10 to the power minus 18 meters yes absolutely yeah. you're right okay. Okay. and if we can squeeze the sun mm. our our sun up to the size of say 1 peanut mm. then the entire sun or i will turn into a black hole and that was mm. actually the first solution exact mm. solution which paul mm. schwarzschild this and that is mm-hmm. called schwarzschild radius mm-hmm. it is denoted by r sub s which tells mm-hmm. that any matter which is squeezed up to that radius will turn into a black hole mhm so so how does like you saying um if if any object of any sort of mass gets uh like you're saying that there's a particular threshold of density that you need to reach yes. in order to become right. a black hole right right and irrespective of what mass you have irrespective of whatever it is so is that also related to the idea that in quantum mechanics like in classical mechanics mass is generally considered to be constant but in quantum mechanics that is not the case especially when Absolutely. objects are moving too fast uh, yes yeah. actually what happens in case mm-hmm. of quantum mechanics the problem is that see th- this is this is again a realm of thought see mm-hmm. when we are talking of classical mechanics remember that einstein general theory and special theory of relativity is also classical mechanics we need mm-hmm. to first understand the branch that what is meant by classical mechanics is it galileo copernicus newton einstein what what do we mean by classical mechanics mm-hmm. so the thing is that classical mechanics or anything which we tell is following classical mechanics it means that the world is deterministic i repeat the entire calculations are deterministic that means if i throw so there's a, ball, a reason so there's a reason why things happen is that what it yes. is yes so 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 what happens is that in terms of classical mechanics there is a determinism 
there is a point of determinism and this point of determinism is not only that the goal ball will land up there it will again rebound and come back to me that means if i if i if i if i, if I go back to these situations i can predict a kind of a future mathematically that means mm -hmm. if the cup is falling down if i roll back those molecules it will again form a cup mm -hmm. theoretically right mm -hmm. so classical mechanics is something which is very much deterministic in nature now what you are talking is about quantum mechanics in quantum mechanics everything is probabilistic mm -hmm. the electron might be there might not be there there is a mm -hmm. probability that the electron will be 30% in divyansh house and 70% in my house mm -hmm. so what is happening is that because of the uh, probabilistic nature the non deterministic nature the probability whether it can be here it can be can can cannot be here we actually cannot incorporate gravity with quantum mechanics mm -hmm. so that mm -hmm. is what the string theory the quantum field theory all we are trying to do right now is how we can incorporate gravity with quantum mechanics because gravity is the only force in standard model of particle physics which cannot fit with the standard model electromagnetism is done strong force is done weak force is done gauge bosons are there higgs boson are there but it is only gravity which cannot fit with the standard model so that is the reason whatever we are discussing today are all in a classical realm which cannot fit with the quantum realm hmm. but you saying that in classical realm usually uh, things are deterministic so uh, how did like einstein, um not just einstein but scientists like feynman uh, recognize that there is a possibility to actually calculate the motions of the future of what an electron will be doing uh, inside an atom yeah. which is basically in the quantum realm so how did he or people like uh, feynman do okay. do that okay that's a very good question um, uh, let me explain you this way what feynman and the people of quantum mechanics calculated all the calculations are based on a certain certain probability now see what happens is that feynman actually invented what is called the path integral formalism that means if i if a particle is around here and mm. if i trace back that particle that it will be around here it might be remember that in quantum mechanics you cannot tell that the particle will be you has to use the word might be right hmm. so from hmm. here the particle might move into this place but feynman told that it uh, what would you say it will go either here or in this way or in this way whatever but feynman told that the particle will move in all possible paths this way this way that way this way that way this way so hmm. that is called uh, the feynman path integral formalism for which he was awarded the nobel prize in physics so whatever you are talking about the electron's path about the subatomic particle's path remember these are all nothing but probability of calculation because heisenberg's uncertainty principle which is the core of quantum mechanics tell that you cannot find the position and momentum simultaneously at the same place right mm -hmm. so uh, what we are discussing or what you are asking about quantum mechanics about the electrons how do they behave these remember are all probabilities these mm -hmm. are all probabilities these are all probability density which tells that it might be there might be a chance that the electron might land up here or it might be here but classical mm -hmm. physics tells that the particle will be there in another 2.5 minutes time so there is a fundamental difference and that difference has not led the mathematicians learn or till now in 2023 when we are talking we cannot find graviton the uh, the hypothetical particle we cannot equate the equations of relativity with quantum mechanics so quantum mechanics remember has only been uh, i would say married married happily only with special theory of relativity that is called quantum electrodynamics which was done by paul dirac paul dirac only uh, you know used the quantum formulations with special theory of relativity and that is called qed the two things quantum electrodynamics and chromodynamics so qed uh, founded by paul dirac actually uh, where we assimilated the equations of special theory of relativity with quantum mechanics but general theory of relativity still remains unmarried bachelor living happily
Mm-hmm. The, it it is getting so intense. I know most of the viewers. I mean, a few of them might be listening, but some of them, or at least the majority of them, might have left by thinking that, oh my God, what is happening? It's just getting too complex. But I mean, I'm having fun personally. So uh, let be. Uh, okay. So uh, another thing that, considering that Einstein's field equations are really complex, and as I said, we are not going to delve into the mathematical concepts of it i would really like to know what was the thinking behind like what what was the thinking behind the creation of these equations like um if okay. you if you yeah if you are able to explain that okay. yeah mm-hmm. that is also an intense question divyansh i don't know how the viewers would be enjoying but i have a lot to tell because i have been specializing on this subject mm-hmm. so see what happened is that as from special theory of relativity and on that burn office when einstein understood that there is nothing which is can be termed as a gravity he immediately went back to his equation and started to find something which will give a kind of a covariant theory of gravity i will like to mention within quotes what do we mean by covariant theory there is one thing which is called a contravariant and a covariant so covariant means something for example uh, i might say that uh, if it is raining then it should be cloudy for example that means rain and cloud are covariant with each other okay I or i might say that if it is uh, if, if it is sunny it should not rain that means sun and uh, rain doesn't go with each other and mm-hmm. another is called contravariant which is totally opposite i am not going into that so einstein thought that i need to find out what is called a covariant theory of gravity that means the gravity or the equation which goes hand in hand now why mm. i will go a little bit deeper to make you understand now say for example i am throwing a piece of ball mm-hmm. right it is my frame of reference x and y i am not taking three dimension because again it will be too complicated x axis and y axis right x mm. and y axis i am mm. throwing a ball fine so as per the lagrangian and newton formalism we can do the calculations mm. now what happens that the same i the same me i'm throwing the ball and you divyansh you come and you rotate the frame of reference you just rotate it uh-huh. right so will the throwing of the ball will be the same it will be the same but as the, the frames trajectory. of reference yeah the trajectory is going to change now what will happen if you stretch the frame of reference that means i am in x y axis and suddenly you stretch it and still i throw now what happened is that einstein actually thought that if the frames of reference are arbitrary because remember special theory of relativity is all about the inertial frame of reference not a non inertial frame of reference so what if if the if the entire space time is curved it has got a dent it has got a higher curvature it is low yeah, yeah, but yeah. still mathematicians we need to measure the laws of physics still the ball will fall still the cannon ball will fly still the trajectory so i mean to say we need to calculate the laws of physics in a proper way so that mm-hmm. was a very big problem because if the frames of reference are stretched they are squeezed they are turned the laws of physics are not uh, according to the laws of science so that is what which is called a covariant theory of gravity that means whatever is going to happen you remember einstein told that whatever the laws of physics are happening in all frames of reference it is should be the same now based on the same principle you see in special theory of relativity he told that the speed of light is constant mm-hmm. the speed of light is constant i mean to say in vacuum obviously we know that speed of light changes when it goes into media like water or otherwise so the speed mm-hmm. of light is constant so if the speed of light is constant that means this frame of reference and this frame of reference i would see the same thing hmm. that was in special relativity but in general relativity everything was turned upside down because the space time all are curved it is not same so what would happen if these frames of reference are changed so as soon the frames of reference are changed uh, you were asking me what actually did so that actually help time stand to think that what what i can do how can i frame the physics law so that the even if the frames of reference are changed even there is a curvature even there is a low and high but still the laws of physics are same uh-huh. now it was during 
yeah it was during that time that einstein the genius dr albert einstein was feeling helpless why helpless i will tell you because all those curvatures all the curved the space and the curvature and those actually einstein was not aware about differential geometry we i i think we need to go back uh, some time uh, then we will explore more about how differential geometry and relativity is related but it was one specific person i called him the grand grand daddy of mathematics that is bernhard riemann right hmm. i also keep the photograph of bernhard riemann in my mobile so i don't have the mobile right now if i show you my wallpaper is that of bernhard riemann so hmm. it was uh, back in 1849 that bernhard riemann first proposed the concept of what is called a manifold manifold means structure for example my hand for example this one this is a manifold you see there is a lot of curves yeah. bends everything yeah. is not thin right hmm. so this is a manifold so einstein was not aware about this type of mathematics because if the space is curved like my hand hmm. right then how will i measure this one or this one or this one so during that time you remember marcel grossman was dating the same lady which albert einstein later married <laughs> so <laughs> albert marcel grossman uh, and then his friend michel besso they are they were all you know good friends in the, poly, the zurich polytechnic so mm-hmm. i remember that famous line that uh, einstein went to grossman and told that grossman grossman save me or else i will go crazy mm-hmm. that means that i am unable to frame those tensors and differential geometry and please do help me out so mm-hmm. it was during that time that marcel grossman along with michel besso uh, on the italian front it was tullio levi civita it was uh, uh, bernhard riemann it was gregorio ricci curvastro all of them already have framed differential geometry on their own part i mean to say mm-hmm. differential geometry remember the bianch it has nothing to do with relativity absolutely not differential geometry is a subject of mathematics which mm-hmm. is independently developed by various people right if you go to my video on differential geometry history you will understand i have made a 45 minutes video on how differential geometry evolved anyway so that was there but essentially here in germany in switzerland there was a connection between that those people and ultimately marcel grossman if you see i have shown the marks of Gross, marcel grossman on the paper uh, it is a kind of a Uh, archive from the jewish library i have shown in my video that uh, einstein has written and marcel grossman has corrected and put a round and said no 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 this is not right this should be the proper proper uh, proper way of mathematics so mm-hmm. that was the thinking which actually with the help of grossman with the help of michel besso and few other people that for the first time einstein came to know what is called tensor mm. so uh, remember that the- Yeah, please. Yeah, expa- yeah, yeah, yeah. Are you explaining tensors? No, I'm not explaining tensors. Okay. Then the viewers okay. will uh, possibly fly away, or they would uh, not enjoy this show. So <laughs> uh, we will put it uh, again in the next episode if somebody is willing. So tensors yeah. are actually uh, not being known by Einstein, and it was Grossman and other people who helped to frame the uh, mathematics of. einstein's field equations so the thinking what was the thinking thinking was to frame a kind of a mathematical law a model of mathematics where in spite of the change of references the things being stretched or squeezed or uh, rotated whatever things will be same that means for example if this is my frame of reference for example right mm-hmm. so the measurement will be always the same if i do it this if i do it that if i stretch it if i squeeze it that means the basis of the vector i again i'm sorry to use this technical term the main alignment of the measurement the vector would be the same right would be the same but whatever happens to the frame of reference it should not matter that is the culmination that is what is called the covariance theory and you see general theory of relativity the first postulate it is a fully covariant theory of gravity where whatever happens whatever mm-hmm. happens mm-hmm. laws of physics will be the same uh-huh. and and in the beginning of your explanation you mentioned uh, uh, that uh, like you didn't go into uh, the three dimensions but uh, you you explained it two dimensions and uh, when i was uh, reading about and watching videos on 
uh, Einstein's field equations, I got to know that uh, when they're solving the matrices part of the tensors in the equations, they usually uh, like they use uh, four dimensions in general. Like yes, um, yeah, right. Yeah. So. Right. Uh, so they are basically numbered like zero, one, two, three. So uh, zero is time, right, one is one, one is length, two is base, and three is height. Right, so absolutely. my question, yeah. so my question to you is that we are as you know as kids and uh, people in schools and usually in general in the beginning are are told that um, the f- the basics and the starting uh, considered dimensions that we need to learn are the later three three dimensions that we are usually familiar with that uh, usually like to blend with classical mechanics in general. So why did uh, the people who uh, developed these equations mention uh, time as the first dimension in the zero, in the zero part? Uh, yeah, what was the reason? Yeah, behind that's it? a good question. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So actually what happened is that if you see the classical mechanics era, time and space was something totally different. The axis, if you measure the coordinate, I would say the Cartesian axis. So either you measure the distance in X axis and the time in Y axis. Hmm. Okay. Now what happened is that when the special theory of relativity came in, Einstein found that if we consider these equations, taking time as a separate axis or as a separate dimension, the complications will be more. Because remember, when we are moving from special theory of relativity to general theory of relativity, there is a huge, huge, huge amount of complex mathematics which comes in. Tensor calculus, differential geometry, curvatures, Riemann. I mean, it's a, it's a huge, it's a huge. Mm-hmm. So what happened is that special theory of relativity, when it arrived, Einstein thought that if I take time as a separate dimension and mm-hmm. put space separate, then the formulations of Maxwell's equation, which is the main part when Einstein synthesized with his uh, equations, will create a lot of problem. Mm -hmm. So now now the question is that why? Now see, Mm -hmm. for example, right now it is around whatever the time is 657. Mm I'm sitting straight. I'm not moving. So what Mm -hmm. would the Newtonian mechanics will tell? That I am static, right? Right. I am sitting still. But the relativity will tell that even if you are static, you are Mm -hmm. moving. Why? Because the time is ticking on the other Uh axis. Uh Uh Right. Now, if I start moving in this direction, then my movement is also there. Time is also there. Mm -hmm. So you see that already we have got two dimensions. Mm -hmm. Now I start moving up and down and I take other dimensions. So it becomes more and more and more complex. Mm -hmm. That was the strike of a super genius, which requires a super genius like Einstein. He thought that, okay, let me put it all together. Hmm. Let me lump it together into space time. Hmm. Right. So what happened is that time is just a coordinate now. It is just a coordinate that uh, you will see that I have explained in uh, my uh, videos in black holes that people say that time stops near black hole. No, absolutely wrong. Time never stops near time clicks on uh, goes on ticking but what happens is that if we take space and time as a coordinate and if i stretch the time say for example this one mm-hmm. and i stretched it mm-hmm. further so what mm-hmm. will happen so if it will take a longer time to reach your home it will be curved right instead of going straight so you, i'm going in so you're saying that it will take a longer time for time to reach one point from the other than it will absolutely 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 so in black hole what happens is that the time coordinate is stretched so it takes more time to reach I see, I see. rather than a straight line right mm-hmm. so that was basically what einstein did is that instead of taking time and space different let us lump it together so what is the benefit benefit is that once you put things together equations are much simpler number one and you will see in general yeah in general theory of relativity because time is a coordinate so you can do any mathematics with time you can stretch it you can bend it you can squeeze it it won't take much more difficulty but if you take time as a separate dimension a separate set of equations then how you're going to i would say coordinate the other equations with time so it was all taken in one lump and we now call it a space time hmm. so even if i'm sitting straight right now hmm. right my space time is one Hmm. My space says that I'm not moving, but the time goes on taking one, two, three, four, five, six. Hmm. So the entire concept of space and time is now one 
only one identity space time so if you see the einstein's field equations the first one r mu nu so mu nu is basically space time so mm. zero length one breadth uh, two height and number four is time so we don't have to solve further equations which we used to do with newtonian mechanics with time but whatever the equations are now it is applicable both to space as well as to time mm. Mm. i see i see i see i see what you're saying cool uh so moving on to the next question um so uh i think okay we already discussed this one uh so when scientists or maybe you might have worked uh on einstein's field equations uh previously so, so how do you think they faced and overcame over the biggest of challenges that uh, they had during the making of these equations uh to be see uh, to be honest with you once we received those equations it revolutionized the entire way we look into structured space time as i told you that famous inspirational story of carl schwarzschild schwarzschild was the first to design the first uh, uh, um, you know uh, first uh, solution to einstein field equation then it was james kerr which is called kerr newman metric it was further framed then it was einstein lemar and La- other equations so the problem you know is that due to its complexity due to its complexity you cannot just sit down with a pen and paper and solve the equations mm-hmm. there are lot of initial conditions etc which are required so the problem is that when we say for example uh, for example uh, you are sitting on a chair right now okay so obviously you have got a mass right and if you're sitting on a chair then the chair is on the floor that means there is a pressure and the pressure will create a kind of a curvature <coughs> now if i say for example that i will sit down right now and i will uh, i will use einstein's field equation to calculate how much curvature your chair causes on the on the on, on the what you call on the floor i won't mm-hmm. be able to do that mm-hmm. i won't be able to do that yeah the reason mm-hmm. is that i will i will tell you the basic reason there is a specific reason which most of the students or most of the people there don't don't understand this would lead mm-hmm. lead us to the next uh, question that why einstein's field equations have got certain problems now see mm-hmm. if i take for example uh, a kind of an element which we called Uh, which is which is which is considered to be one of the densest uh, elements uh, that uh, is called osmium osmium okay, okay. Right. this osmium is because it is the densest metal which we found and it is i think it is around 22.6 multiplied 10 to the power some 6 kilograms per cubed meter i i mean to say it is roughly you can say three times that of an iron mm-hmm. right now it, Uh, so it is a very dense right and mm. you remember that i thought that if you can squeeze matter up to a critical level it will turn into a black hole right we can uh-huh. talk about lot of black holes maybe in the next episode so i take a, a kind of an osmium right which is the densest metal known naturally and mm. i multiply it by c squared that is the speed of light right and what i still get that means what am i am doing a multiplication of c squared because i want to calculate the rest energy i want mm. to calculate the rest energy of such a dense material what it would become mm-hmm. still it would give around 2.2 uh, into 10 to the power something joules something like that right mm-hmm. now this density actually produces some kind of a 10 to the power minus 22 inverse meter squared now to the viewers i am making things very simple now why we are, i am telling is that i am taking the densest material available on earth i am making it travel as close as to the speed of light as close as to the speed of light but still i am getting an energy density which is 10 to the power minus 22 hmm. now that means that when we say that gravity is a weak force you must have heard that gravity is a weak force electromagnetism these are uh, strong forces what do we mean by weak force is it that if i pull it will not come it is a weak force no Mm. it means that it requires a huge huge amount of energy density to measure a small curvature uh-huh. so even if i take the densest material multiply it by c square and find out its rest energy i get such a fractional curvature that mm. einstein field equations won't be able to measure that 
and in order to do that what we do is that we see we go to much massive scales like uh-huh. jupiter so, like sun so you so you saying that finally that we found out that density is actually not in correlation with the with the gravitational pull of any object no and, no i am saying that if we take the densest material and if uh-huh. we try to find out the energy density which is the first component of the stress energy momentum tensor that means in easy language i can say that i need to measure that if i put this ac remote on my hand how uh-huh. much curvature this ac remote is going to bring i want to measure that so ac remote is too light i am taking one of the densest material on earth i am mm. making it move at the speed of light even that the rest energy density that we get is so so minute that einstein field equations cannot measure it so when we say that gravity is a weak force technically we mean to say that the gravity the general element on earth requires lot of high energy density to give a curvature which mm-hmm. einstein's field equation will measure mm-hmm. and those things are not found on earth and that is why einstein's field equations are applicable in astronomy astrophysics black holes jupiter mercury's perihelion sun earth etc so mm-hmm. the limitation i want the limitation but the application of einstein's field equations are basically on a much more larger scale mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. We, we won't be able to measure that simple mm-hmm. and is, is there is a part in the equation like uh, if i am able to show the viewers okay so i took a few notes that i also sent to shonak sir the other day so yes that was good yeah. Able to, yeah yeah absolutely so if you if you're able to see this one yes uh, um, right okay yeah this one in, this one over here yeah. in the middle uh so right. uh, this so this one this one tells actually uh, how much uh massive uh, doesn't doesn't all that need to be in order right. to bend the fabric of space time right so yeah if you could answer in answer that question what did uh, we find find out like how much does it actually have to be okay if, if actually the it. left hand side of the equation as i was mm-hmm. telling that the mm-hmm. r mu nu etc measures mm-hmm. the curvature and the right hand side actually measures the stress energy momentum tensor as you rightly mm-hmm. pointed out that how much mass should be present yeah. so that means Uh, the normal terrestrial objects the normal a uh, book maybe an elephant maybe a uh, 10000 elephant etc mm-hmm. are not sufficient to measure the curvature of space time so the minimum thing that we need to do is to start measuring the mass or the energy density or the movement of sun our sun uh-huh. so i am trying to give an idea to the viewers that how massive the scales of measurement are quantum mechanics which measures at the minimal 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 level i mean to say very minute and mm. that goes beyond 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 our earth and mm. i remember immanuel kant famous philosophical quotation that two things uh, i don't remember the exact quotation it says he says that two things always keep me inspired i always mm. feel uh, strange that is the, the 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 stars on the sky or the huge expanse that has got and the moral law within me the moral law within me can we coincide the huge uh, uh, unknown infinite unknown with the moral law within me anyway that is a philosophical discussion uh, so what i would like to tell is that we should not compare einstein's field equations with anything related to our earth because we are going to fail miserably so einstein's field equations you can say when it comes to use practically if we talk of practical applications for example uh, what arthur eddington did perihelion's uh, precision of mercury that means the planet mercury when it is going down how much it bends okay gravitational waves how uh, gravitational waves are generated yes einstein field equations come when we send a spaceship outside the earth's escape velocity the precision measurement that is done by einstein field equations you might have heard about neutron star neutron star very heavy dense so how the neutron stars are formed or what is the energy density the measurements of those very importantly black holes those are there milky way so anything which is beyond our perception the bianch only mm-hmm. there and the equations will but come then to as you as you mentioned the sun that means uh we can say that because you saying that if, if we have to scale scale it to the measures of the size of the sun that means we can say that anything 
at least i mean in the practicality we can say that anything at least, that has at least the, with mass, the mass of the sun yeah yeah so that means 3 million earths in particular yes right? 3 million earths yeah absolutely so, the mass so, of the sun so right. so do so do do we so do we calculate it for small i mean considering that uh, there are smaller objects definitely uh, in the cells in the cells still bodies yes, so considering yes. that so yes. considering that do we yeah, you, use it this way that because we are taking the relative relativistic mass of the sun we can say that uh, one third the mass of the sun and uh, then then this object yes. can uh, yeah, yeah. The i mean to say if you fabric. yeah very good question yeah if yeah. it is taken in that way if you make a one third mass of the sun Hmm. Then might be I mean I'm just the, saying the reference not not specifically reference, one yeah. third yeah yeah, yeah. Hmm. but 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 do you see that uh, hmm. that that is that is that is the problem that is the thing that whatever we see the vyanch around us i mean to say even i i won't name, i won't name that person hmm. very famous scientist from isro uh, hmm. we were talking about application exactly the question that you asked that sir hmm. what is the application of einstein's field equation so hmm. he told me shonak to be very honest with you whatever we see around i mean to say mechanics trucks engineering even the uh, the sailing of the shores of the oceans the liners everything i mean to say whatever you can perceive in general even sending a space ship or a rocket out of the escape velocity of earth mm-hmm. there is only one person who rules that is sir isaac newton Mm-hmm. So what I'm trying to say is that everything that we see from mechanics to our daily life applications everything that we mm. see is all followed by Newton's laws of mechanics Einstein's field equations are extreme that is you see when you read uh, internet you will see extreme conditions extreme means what extreme that is a very big that means now if you if i say that today tomorrow morning are you going to calculate the uh, ma- mass of the black hole or how the sun, sun would travel no in our daily applications we don't find einstein and we also don't find relativity now question is that why we don't find relativity the reason is that relativity is only concerned when things are moving at the speed of light now if i run too fast tomorrow morning and if i dream that okay i'm going to run as close to the speed of light what will happen my ligaments will break and we won't be able to talk for the next podcast episode <laughs> right so what is happening is that whatever we are seeing things around the speed whatever the highest speed spacecraft etc they are not up to the frame of reference of the speed of light that means you cannot compare a elephant to a um, um, orange the comparison or the measurement should be in the same scale so mm-hmm. the relativity is only applicable when particles or objects are traveling as close at the speed of light and remember mm-hmm. only when they travel at the speed of light you will be able to see time dilation twin mm-hmm. paradox your age is going to slow down these that all those things mm-hmm. but these are again theoretical but somehow this has been explained now we uh, sent two uh, you know dogs out in the space and we found mm-hmm. time dilation anyway mm-hmm. but in general Uh, relativistic equations are not applicable why because it speaks of extreme condition that when you will move at the speed of light these things are going to happen number mm-hmm. one second einstein's field equations also these are applicable to extreme big masses like jupiter or sun or black holes or gravitational waves etc and again quantum mechanics is something which is applicable to a very small realm although the good part is that uh, don't mind telling me this because i am a relativistic by heart and soul but quantum mechanics is far more applicable to real business considered to that of einstein's relativity because we can create teleportation we are trying to create we are creating cryptocurrency we are using data security we are using lot of quantum tunneling etc so quantum mm-hmm. mechanics that is why in india most of the students they do a research on quantum mechanics not on astrophysics because mm. there is a direct application you can go to bitcoin and cryptocurrency using quantum mechanics so mm. that means what? that means we can conclude that ultimately the reality that we see around and the way we behave or tomorrow morning you would be going out for your school or college you will go to studies i will go to my college whatever the realm that we see around right now or in in the future are all being guided by newtonian mechanics right 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 and 
uh, one more thing. Uh, so you saying in these extreme conditions, you mean uh, so I, uh, something has to travel at uh, speeds that are actually uh, present in the reference Almost of the speed of, speed of light. Almost to the speed of light. Yeah, in yeah. the reference of of the speed of light, or they have to be True. like, is there is there like two two conditions? Like either they have to be truly like massive, like in comparison to the sun, like you said, or they have to. We are traveling no, at uh, no, no. high speeds. No, I am saying, uh, no, no. What I am trying to say is that mm-hmm. if you apply the rules or the equations of special mm-hmm. theory of relativity, mm-hmm. and you want to say that okay, I apply Lorentz mm-hmm. transformation or anything, mm-hmm. and I want mm-hmm. to see that if I travel at the speed of light, the light, my mass is going to contract. Is something mm-hmm. like that? Then mm-hmm. I have to travel as close as to the speed of light. That means mm-hmm. if that object is traveling in that speed. then only the rules or the laws of special relativity or the equations will work otherwise mm-hmm. newtonian mechanics will basically be applicable mm-hmm. okay uh i've not even fini- finished half of the questions that i have so <laughs> i would say we will need a second episode to just talk about einstein's field equations again to sure, be honest because, sure. I, because i i, I, I am actually you, i am actually exhausted i've never felt exhausted and seeing your energy for about one one hour and above one hour now right and you're still explaining with such enthusiasm and like wow how much yeah because yeah, that is my love for this subject and mm-hmm. remember that we do we might need further episodes because yeah, yeah. you see i i went much more detailed i studied mm-hmm. a lot and generating those videos because mm-hmm. what we are trying to do is not possible we are trying mm-hmm. to frame a 10 years history mm-hmm. of science into one mm-hmm. hour which is hmm. out of question right it it would be a great a great title to 10 years 10 years and uh, centuries of work into compressed into one hour of uh, explanation so that <laughs> would be a great title in its own self but yeah uh, sure. we th- to be honest i think we would need to uh, skip for now and have a second episode with uh, you sure. sir uh, on einstein's field equation we'll have it very soon probably next week or uh, sometime very soon i would say and sure. uh, yep absolutely and, yeah yep thank you everyone who stayed till the end if uh, you are still <laughs> listening and uh, yeah uh, well uh, i yeah, hope th- uh, you, you also enjoyed to... yeah i yeah, enjoyed i hope you yeah, also enjoyed, enjoyed it it. yeah yeah sure uh, so yeah thank so you i everyone. wish you all the best mm-hmm. i wish you all the best and your the wimper podcast because you're bringing great people and uh, uh, i i i i feel good and that is why i told you that i need time to talk because there is so much amount of implications etc right. uh, i cannot just talk on a superficial basis this would require time so thank you for hosting me the vyansh i'm mm-hmm. really grateful and thankful and let us see when we can meet uh, maybe very yeah, soon sure. for the next episode yeah, sure. a pleasure to have you and uh, uh, yeah one more thing if you have uh, got any suggestions for us any form of feedback that you might want to give on the basis of our conversation uh, uh the feedback i would say uh, i would wait for the viewers to comment and let us know that yeah. how this episode is going on mm-hmm. that is only one thing i wish all the best to wimper and i only want the young generation not to fall in the wrong uh, perception of science and mathematics just reading books which doesn't contain equation it doesn't means that you understand science black holes and wormholes so just to get into the reality it might be difficult it might be a little bit boring to understand mathematics but without that you won't be able to understand the reality the biggest fear is that you fall into false notions which i as a teacher won't uh, want you to do that and uh, by the way uh, in the description i'll scan these very little four page notes that i uh, got and uh, i'll send also send them to shonak sir so i'll just uh, uh, make them up in a P- pdf file and just uh, link it to my google drive and you can have an access to it and uh, have a g- quick read on it this is just really short you can see four pages worth of uh, notes short notes Uh, they also have something a little bit on black holes. No, no, not black holes. Wormholes, actually. So yeah, uh, thank you everyone for listening to another episode. We'll surely have to have a part two of it. Uh, this is your host, Divyansh Gunjan, and keep looking up.